Uh, what I wanted to do today is uh, uh, I got a couple of things for you. And like I said, this is uh, just a shoot the bull kind of session anyway. But I do have some uh, uh, a couple of interesting things to start with. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen here. Well, let me, no, let me just say this. In part of that, the CARES Act that just was passed, one of the things that I haven't heard very much about, uh, but is, could be important to, to many of our clients, and that is that you do not have to take minimum required distributions this year. And it may be that if you've taken them already, you can put them back. I, I'm not positive about that. But at any rate, the... Uh, yes, uh, the you, can, yeah. you can put them back. Well, now that... Uh, the same reason I'm not sure about it is it may have only applied to those people who um, um, turned 70 and a half... Last year. Last year. I, I'm not really clear on that. Um, All right. So, but for, we have a lot of clients that are, that take minimum required distributions every year. And if that's coming out of your portfolio and your, and your, your, uh, uh, you know, the stock market is so far down, well, it's doing more damage than you would like to your investments. Then, uh, uh, it may, for some people, it may be advisable to hold off on taking the minimum required distributions. So, at any rate, I think that was interesting, and it'll for some people that ought to, ought to be an important thing. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, investing in a uh, in a market crash like we've been going through. And so, um, uh, the first thing I thought I might show you is a slideshow that was produced by uh, Mats and Money, my co-advisor. And of course, one of the big th the things that happens in, in any time there's a crash is people get all worried and they, uh, they feel like they need to get out of the market or they sell or whatever. And a lot of times people do a lot of damage to their, um, to their uh, investments by getting out of the market when the market crashes because it makes everybody nervous when the market crashes. But um, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and show you a, uh, a slideshow, and I'm just gonna talk you through it. I think it gives a, helps to give an interesting perspective on the markets. Um, and it also leads to a conclude, it, it, it points you towards an idea that I think is very important that the, uh, uh, the, the news and things that happen, um, and a lot of times we see those as controlling the market. In the long run, uh, they tend to just be noise. So with that, let me, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Bob, just should... real quick before you share, uh -huh. I just want to tell people again that if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says chat. And if you click that, you can see the, the chat chatter that's going on, or you can type messages to Bob while he's presenting this. Okay. All righty. So I'm going to share the screen. And um, okay, you should be able to see a, a, a screen that says uh, OMG, Global Economic Armageddon. Should we get out of the market? So, Mary, is that looking okay on your screen? Let's see, you're muted, Mary. Give me the thumbs up there. Can you all that see looks that? Okay? Good. Yeah, okay, good. All righty. So, uh, see if I can, I'm trying to advance it here just a second. Let me see if I can pull this off. Okay, so we live in an oh my gosh culture. Every, things are coming up all the time. So, you know, Trump was elected. Should we get out of the market? If you remember the, uh, the night he was elected, there was, the people were saying on the, on the, the TV and the news that, it, that the markets were all going to crash because Trump was such a uh, either terrible person or, or was so unpredictable. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the futures market overnight on election night showed that the market was going to open up hundreds of points down. And it did, although it recovered later that day. But it just shows the, the, the level of emotion that sort of colors events. And, and sometimes it's very, it only lasts a brief time, and other times it lasts for months or longer. Uh, you know, when, when Obama was reelected, there were a lot of people, depending on your, which side of the political spectrum you're on, that thought, oh, this really is the end. We've got Obama again, and uh, he's going to wreck our economy and wreck our system. And of course, back in the, you know, this was going on forever. Uh, many people, you know, felt like uh, Carter was one of the most ineffective presidents and caused all kinds of trouble. Or uh, in 1987, the market crashed. And it seemed like to me, it kind of came out of the blue, but the market just sank like a rock. And uh, it, it got, it, the whole world was uh, a shudder there for a while, although the market actually recovered fairly quickly. And of course, the 9-11, everybody remembers that. And uh, it had a tremendous effect on the market, and it, uh, it, at least temporarily. And then after the 2008, they, they passed TARP and all the idea of the money being poured on the, the uh, shovel-ready projects and so forth. And a lot of people said, this is going to just uh, crash the system because we're creating so much debt. Um, and then in uh, 2015, uh, Greece defaulted, and the whole for months the newspapers were talking about the idea that Europe was going to go broke and it was going to have an effect worldwide on markets and banking. So, and then it wasn't very long ago. Actually, it was the 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 spring after. Uh, uh, after uh, Trump was elected, that was Brexit was in the news every day about the fact that it was going to to uh, damage the markets in uh, Europe and it was going to spread to the United States and have all kinds of effects. And the idea was that it was a bad time to invest in the U.S. market because of the uncertainty, and it was a dreadful time uh, to invest in the U in international markets. Now, as it turned out, neither of those things was true at all. 2017 turned out to be a very good investment year in the United States and abroad. Now, what's the point? There is always something coming up, something happening, some new bolt out of the blue, we think, that's changed the landscape and might uh, alter things forever. So remember this deal? $18 trillion in uh, debt, in the debt, the national debt clock. Well, then it was 21, and now it's headed for $23 trillion. And so the, the debt hawks and people that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of economists and so forth are very concerned about the level of debt in this country and the rate at which it's rising. And, of course, this, this, uh, this CARES Act is just going to, pour money out of the treasury, uh, trillions. And so um, it's not clear where this is ever going to end. So this creates a sense that we live in a world that's just out of control. And, um, and there are always threats and reasons to be fear, fearful. And that fear can destroy wealth. And it can destroy our way of thinking about things um, in, a, in, a more, in a more productive way. So let's just take, take pandemics, for example. So here's a chart that shows um, the SARS epidemic in, uh, and um, Mary, you, tell us, uh, tell everybody if they've got, depends on what's on their screen, but like on my screen, part of it is covered up by the little thumbnails of everybody that's on there. Could you tell them how to okay. suppress that in case it's in the way? Yeah. If the th 
thumbnails are getting in your way, just scroll to the top of that thumbnail screen and you'll see three boxes. One looks like a minus sign, one looks like a small square, and then one looks like two squares on top of each other. The minus sign will just say who's talking and it won't show any pictures. At the one thumbnail will just show Bob and then the two thumbnails stacked will show everybody the way you're seeing them now. So that way you can get us all off of your screen and out of your way. Thank you very much. So back to the screen. So it shows the SARS epidemic in 2003. And then it shows how the different uh, indexes, different, and these are uh, asset classes of, uh, um, of equities. So the most common one is about two thirds of the way down. It says the S&P 500 index. Everybody knows what that is. It's uh, the 500 largest um, companies in the United States by market capitalization. So that's the famous S&P 500 index. But there's lots of other asset classes uh, that represent other parts of the US equity markets or of the international markets. And so those are a bunch of them are listed there. And what this is showing you in the year that we had the SARS epidemic, the markets just soared. Well, wait a minute. I thought a SARS epidemic or uh, the pandemic we're having would crash all the markets, but it, it had apparently no effect or a good effect. Well, uh, I guess we would be inclined to say it must have had no effect. And what, what was happening in two, 2003? Well, the U.S. was coming out of the tech crash, and that's why most of the equity markets were up in 2003. The five-year annualized return on those, uh, it's sort of a mixed bag, but keep in mind this five-year period ended with the, uh, the worldwide market crash of 2008. So that's what damaged this, not SARS. So it doesn't, I mean, it just seems like anybody, SARS epidemic uh, didn't have any effect on the markets. But if it had an effect, it was a good one. Okay, then we have the, uh, the bird flu in 2009. Okay, so the year 2009, the markets, all those indexes were up like a bullet not because the bird flu was a good thing, it was because we were coming out of the, the 2008 crash. And then the returns for the next five years on all of those indexes was extremely high. And then we have the Ebola in 2014, and um, you can see that, that the returns that year were mixed, but they were mostly positive. And the returns over the next five years were extremely strong. So you'd have to say, well, I don't see how the, the Ebola had much to do that with that. So imagine this, imagine this, in, in, the, in World War II, 75 million people died. And by the end of World War, the, the, in 1945, I mean, many countries were just smoldering heaps, right? Well, how did the U.S. stock market do? So from September 1, 1939, that was the start of, the, of World War II when Germany invaded Poland until 930, 1945, which was after the Japanese surrendered. So in a time when the whole world is a smoking heap, the S&P 500 index went up almost 13% a year during that period. Huh. So there was a world war and the returns were excellent. So what this this what we're what we're talking about here is that um, people make decisions and, and and naturally because this is what the media is focused on, the magazines are focused on, the TV is focused on, the, the uh, Wall Street Journal is focused on. It's focused on taxes and tax policy. It's it's uh, focused on different financial um, 
metrics about the economy or about individual stocks or industries, and it's focused on where the headlines are. And the markets, you know, they react to headlines, they react to current events. And so then we, we, it, we extrapolate that and think, well, then uh, all of these things matter in thinking about our investments, and especially the political environment. So when, when, when the wrong, in our view, the wrong people are elected, then we get all worried that that's going to have an effect on uh, uh, our investments and the future of investing and so forth. And so this is what we factor in to, the, to our investment uh, calculation. Let's see, who is that talking? I thought somebody had a comment. You're welcome to talk if you like. Now, let, let me show you something else. What if, so, you know, one of the things we, you can't really do, although everybody tries to do it, and, and a lot of financial um, advice is based on timing the market, right? If, if you knew exactly when this, this uh, crash was going to start and you knew when it was going to turn back up, you can make a ton of money. The problem is that people are not really clairvoyant. And if you manage to time it, you were just lucky, just lucky. So, uh, but let's just imagine for a second that with our perfect hindsight, or we forecast when each recession is gonna be. Suddenly is concerning. Uh, and so this, this chart shows that uh, um, when those recessions were. So you can see uh, it goes all the way back to 1900 on this chart, and it goes out to uh, 2010 or so. And uh, it shows each, each recession. So you think what I would do is before the recession started, I would sell my portfolio and then I would buy back once the recession was over and I would just make a ton of money. This is the whole idea, of course, of, of timing stuff. So let me show you this, next slide. <clears throat> so this is showing US equity return, returns during recession years. And so then on this chart, it says uh, recession. And then you go across and it says during that, the real GDP growth on average went down by 4%, a little over 4%. But the return on equities was 11 during recessions. If you look at all years, the GDP growth was on average 3%. But the equity return was eight. So once again, our assumption or our intuitive sense that if that if the if we're in recession, that's when you want to be out of the market, because you want to be in the market when the when the when the economy is strong. This gives makes a lie out of that. In other words. The fact the recession is not necessarily uh, the conclusion or, or a thought that would come with that is that the recession is not really necessarily bad for your returns on stocks, or maybe that that's not a decisive criteria for success in investing. So low GDP does not predict low future stock returns. Okay, now look at this map. This is a map of the world, and, uh, and it's uh, the date on it's 2020, and it's uh, it was done by um, the Heritage Foundation, and it's the Index of Economic Freedom, and it's kind of busy, but the it's simple. If it's green, it's a basically a free economy, a market-oriented free economy. And as, the, as it turns uh, yellower or browner, then the country becomes less free. 
And the ones that are gray, can't tell um, what's going on with them. So the question is, is what kind of economies would be best for investing? And economic freedom and the success of equity markets are correlated. Here is a correlation, okay? And so this is showing you that um, See, I think it's got something else here. Whoops. Um, can't get to behave. It shows the, the amount. The point here is that the three year nations, the Mo3, they grow from, from, we're talking about from 1994 until uh, 2019. Those economies uh, uh, grow much more strongly than those that are not free or that are um, less free. So freedom and economic growth, free market systems and economic growth go together. And uh, in going together, that's what produces the higher standard of living and the more abundant societies. Those are correlated. Now, one of our problems as people, here's this, is this thing in our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is in our brain to keep us safe. And so the idea is that if something comes up and it startles us, then our amygdala, amygdala decides whether to run or fight. Okay, so it is, it is quick to go. Uh, it's designed to get us either running or fighting fast. But it doesn't work to our advantage in with the kind of threats we have. And the kind of threats and dangers we have, a lot of them are probabilistic. In other words, what this means is, this is not really, you know, that there's a, a, a burglar in your house. It's that something may not go right. It's that there's a sense of dread about the future. So, the economy might nosedive. There could be a, par a terrorist attack. And our amygdala can't tell the difference between a burglar in your house and, uh, and the idea that we might catch the dreaded uh, coronavirus and end up on one of those ventilators and die. And so this creates, can create this sort of sense of impending um, threat. So also the system's designed to not shut off until the potential dangers vanish completely. And so one thing you could say about modern TV coverage and the fact that everybody's watching the news and the news is focused on things that would create worry because if you're worried, then you'll keep tuning back in. And so it's possible to just create this sort of mood of, of anxiety. Uh, without very much trouble. And you can just see that all about us in our society. And of course, the other thing is they never vanish. If one of them gets, is gone, another one crops up. There's, it just it goes on and on and on. And of course, the, the uh, news and our interest focuses on those things. So it's really easy for this to twist our understanding of the world. So like it's, this says, uh, the airwaves are full of prophets of doom. So, so let's talk about some, some uh, you know, the kind of news you see as time goes by. So February 13th, 2009. <clears throat> now, as it turns out, February 2009 was the exact bottom of the 2008-2009 crash. And so The Economist, which is a well thought of magazine all over the world, all over the English speaking world anyway, and it said in that magazine, new dangers for the world economy. So in other words, rather than The Economist saying, hey, incidentally, this is the very bottom of the, of the market crash. And if you got any money out there, you ought to put it in. Oh no, it says new dangers for the world economy, okay? 
And then uh, in August, June and August, they were talking about the uh, Obamacare and how this was just going to cripple uh, the healthcare uh, industry, create all kinds of uncertainty for the American people. That was some of the thought. And, uh, and others thought, well, this is, you know, this upheaval is going to be desirable. And the deficit hawks thought this was the end of the line. And so this is in June, August 2009. So this is adding more uncertainty at a time when, in fact, when, in fact, you should add your money in, in the stock market. Uh, in January, not in January 2010, so the, the market is pulling out of the crash, and they're saying bubble warning why assets are overvalued. Well, this was an echo of 2007, 2008. Remember, it was all those mortgages that were uh, uh, that they had sold and that they were. They were not solid, and that was all. And remember, all the it was it was it was too much credit pursuing real estate was one of the problems that created the 2008 crash. So here in 2010, they're saying, "Watch out, we've got the same problem again." Then in 2011, the market sort of hit a rough patch, and so the economist says, "Sticky patch or meltdown." So if so, you could worry yourself sick that you were just had just barely gotten back, you were just starting to make some money, and here we go again, maybe you should bail out. In October 2012, they got the bears gonna drop the bull off the, the, uh, the top of the building, and 2012, the market did go down. So if you were, if you were thinking, well, I, this just is too rocky, I need to stay out of the market, uh, would have been a bad choice. And then I like this magazine, Bang Head Here, Euro Cri for Euro Crisis Relief. So then beginning in 2013 and all through the last few years, you know, periodically we've had a big, uh, big stories about the European situation. Of course, there was Bitcoin and Bitcoin. The cat's going to get the bear who's turned into a mouse as the market sags. And now we have the coronavirus. How bad will it get? And, it, and of course, it is bad at this stage. Uh, the markets, the Dow's down, what, by a third or so. And it's better for people not to look at their own uh, investment accounts. But most people have got great big losses in their or declines. I shouldn't use the word loss because you don't have a loss unless you sell out. Okay, if you are well invested and you have confidence in what you're doing, the fact that the market went down, that's no loss unless you sell out and decide to move into to some asset that can't come back. That's the, the big danger. At any rate, once we, get, we start believing the apocalypse is coming, the amygdala goes into high alert, filtering out almost anything up anyone says. And what inf whatever information the amygdala doesn't catch, our confirmation bias, which is now biased toward confirming our imminent destruction, does. So what, I, what I'm driving at there is, and I think this is really uh, true, as we get older, people get, tend to get more pessimistic. The things that we, we grew up with or that we were used to, they seem, you know, they're changing. The world's changing. And this sort of fits with the notion, you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And every, the older generation of every time in history, has said the same thing. The older generation, the you know, world's going to hell in hand, that's what, okay? And so this creates a dim view of the opportunities ahead. And history, in terms of investing and growth of economies, just doesn't bear this out in our modern American history, the last, you know, 200 years. So um, this is not, uh, this is not an accurate way to view the opportunities in uh, investing. Okay, let's, let's just give you another example of this. January 2009 to tw November 2019, food stamps went up from 32 to 36 million. That does not sound healthy. The national debt doubled over that period. My goodness gracious, if you're a deficit hawk, that just sounds like we've lost control. Things can't keep going on. Taken in total, 
the population is convinced that the end is near. Well, if you took that same period from January 2009 to the end of 2019, this uh, is showing the investment of um, in the S&P 500. And so from January 2009 until 2019, how did it do? went up 100,000 would have turned into 451,000 in the S&P 500 index. Um, that's without any fees or anything. That's a theoretical index. But in spite of all of this talk, all of these worries, all of these troubles during this whole period, it was a period of growth in the value of assets, in the growth of our economy, um, in spite of all that. Hmm. So uncertainty happens all the time and colors everything. But you know what? Certainty we take for granted. And yet, in many ways, that is the bedrock that all this is resting on. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that uh, hundreds of millions of people in the United States are going to want to buy toilet paper in the next <laughs> day, week, period, right? And the companies that make that are going to be in a position to sell it. And the suppliers to them are going to be in a position to provide them stuff. And millions of people, hundreds of millions of people are going to eat another meal today. And there are millions of, you know, there, there are all these huge corporations, small businesses, big businesses, millions of people involved in producing that food and those things that we never ever done. And as the population grows and in a free economy where entrepreneurs are trying to satisfy the different needs of, of the people and people become more and better technology, then what's really happening is that there's a dynamic to the society and to the economy that just goes on and on in this in a free economy, in a free country. And so this we take for granted, and yet it is enormously powerful. So what can this tell us? Fear is a liar, and it can destroy your ability to, to manage, safeguard, grow, retain your uh, life savings. And so this is the one of the big shame. I mean, it's a shame that it makes it so hard for regular people to do a good job and be a good steward of their, their life savings. And of course, it's, you know, they're not being a good steward just for the point of being a good steward. The reason we're being a good steward is because, you know, our, our ability to live abundantly, to feel secure, and to help our children and take care of our family is all connected with our ability to uh, grow and sustain our investments. And these fears and these, these uh, uh, things that are happening all the time detract from our ability to see the, po the real possibility and the, really the way it grows. Now, this is a slightly different chart. Uh, it, it, this one start, the other chart I just showed a minute ago went from the start of 2009. This one's going from January 2008. And it's, this one is showing this, uh, this, the CRSP um, decils one through 10. That is the entire US stock market. Okay, that's like the Wilshire 5000. That's the entire stock market. And so if you were invested in the first part of 2008, you can see that that, that index went down dramatically. It went down almost 50%, okay? And then it rose back up and it finally, you got back into plus territory in, in 2012. Finally got back to basically where you were in 2007. So that was a long, ugly haul, okay? But if you'd, hit, if you'd stayed with it, that the total stock market, then your 100,000 would be worth almost three times what it was by now. 
On the other hand, this blue line, the center, the panic line, that's the one month US Treasury bill. So if you were, if you were, went back to cash or uh, you got out of the market right when in, in the start of 2008, then you, you'd still have essentially your $100,000. You would have missed out on this. On the other hand, if you sold out at the bottom and invested in CDs or whatever, you took a, a 52, you, you, your, your life savings was at 52,000 and it's still at 52,000. So this is this huge delta on loss of faith in what we're doing. So in order to be successful investors, in order to be a successful steward, we need to be invested in a way that we have confidence that the market is going, even though there are crashes and declines, it just goes with the territory, that we have confidence that what we're invested in will in fact come back and go higher. The other thing is that we don't want to put ourselves into investments that are too risky, so we just can't stand the decline. And so in, in this example, the, any, if somebody has a million dollars or a hundred thousand, it goes to 50 or they have a million dollars and it goes to 500. That's awfully scary. Um, a lot of people can't deal with that. So we don't want to, we don't want to be in an investment portfolio that we as investors, we just can't stand it going, having that much downside volatility in it. Well, there's plenty of ways to reduce that volatility, but not lose all of the upside. And so, we need confidence in what we're doing. We need to make sure we don't have so much downside risk. We just can't sleep at night. And then we need to stay, we need to hold on to what we've got through these declines and not panic and not sell out on the downside. So we want to focus on what we can control. And the answer is that uh, for most people, you want to be invested in equities. Equities are stocks. We're talking about uh, equity mutual funds. And then as I talk about in other seminars, the, the solid ground here, the way to analyze this, the way to think about how to invest is that you want to invest in asset classes. In other words, uh, it's more effective to invest in those asset classes that have been shown over long periods of time to have a reasonably predictable uh, expected return. This is not a guaranteed return. Nobody in the world may in fact end tomorrow. So there's no guarantee there, but we're talking about over very long periods of time, they've had a predictable and desirable return, uh, expected return, and the distribution of values, the risk is with is uh, predictable. It falls within a predictable range. That's what we're looking for when we decide how to set up our investments. So we've got to own equities because they're the, the for most people, they're the greatest wealth producing tool ever. The other thing is we want to diversify globally. I don't have time to go into that, but uh, whether you are used to this or not, it, it, many people, many people say, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with investing in the United States. I just don't, don't feel comfortable about going overseas um, or, or investing overseas. But uh, the, the studies, the, um, the, once you look at this clearly, then um, there are desirable asset classes uh, and, and that requires you, you need to invest globally. So uh, that's going to be part of it. And then in order for your investments to work and to what we try to do, we're trying to, we're trying to set up a portfolio that doesn't change its risk uh, properties as the markets go up or down. And so in order to do this, you have to rebalance. In other words, you have to sell your winners as they get to be to a larger proportion of your portfolio and buy your losers, if you will, buy other parts of your, port your portfolio that are down. And this is, this is the way to buy low and sell high automatically. Okay. So those are the requirements in order to, to uh, 
And of course, you've got to hold on when the markets are down. So fear can destroy wealth, prudent strategies grow it. So that's the story right there. Uh, so it's a good story to think about, especially when we're in a, in, we're in a, in a crash like this. So with that, let me unshare this for a second and um, talk to you guys. So anybody got questions or thoughts on that? I have, a, uh, let's see how I'm doing on time. Uh, I have another, uh, I, I recently wrote a, uh, uh, some, a uh, newsletter that's going to go out on the, uh, uh, we're going to email everybody. I don't think it's out yet. Mary, is that out yet? That uh, uh, investing into a panic? Yes, it went out on uh, Tuesday. So yesterday, it went out yesterday along with a video. Okay, well, good. Well, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go over that uh, here in just a second because I think it's very uh timely but i want to stop for a second if somebody's got a questions or thoughts uh any questions come in on the chat mary sorry okay. i'm talking on mute again there was a question that says you're recommending not to move uh the 401k and i answered back that we'd like to talk about the best strategy uh with you mr bond and so uh, anyone can call our office and set up a time to speak with you about the best strategies for investment and retirement accounts right now. Great. So is my speaker working okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Um, but for some reason, you're not back as the main person on the screen. So I think that's because you're trying to share your screen again. Um, no, let's see. I am on. Let me see here. So this is speaker view. Let's see, but I'm seeing you, Mary. I wonder why that is. Okay. How about that? Now is everyone seeing Bob? No, we see Mary. Okay. Okay, I think maybe I'm true. Now there's Bob. Okay, did I show up? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'm not quite clear on what just happened. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. And the reason is I'm gonna uh, talk to that uh, 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 email that we sent out about investing into a panic. And so uh, let's talk about that for a second. So here we go again. So this is the uh, uh, screen, this is the uh, email that Mary sent out and it says investing in the market planning. And so the first paragraph says, uh, stay in play. If you're confident in your investments and you're fully invested, then ignore the slide. Your investments will regain their value eventually. You haven't really lost anything. But if you lose heart and sell out and buy an annuity or go to CDs, then you've taken a loss and permanently damaged your future. Many, pe many, many people did this in 2008 and 2009. And this is a tough mental game. The market start to slide, started to slide in 2007 and early 2008. Many people said they would hang tough, but as markets continue to sink, they lost their nerve. So it's important that we, we, keep, our, our, uh, we keep our nerve. And of course, in order to do that, you have to have confidence in what you're doing. Um, and then it talks about courage to rebalance. One more thing for those holding on, your strategy should include rebalancing. Typically, this means selling bonds and buying more stocks or equity mutual funds as the crash continues. This be means buying more of your losers as they decline. Lots of people can't stand to do this, but you can bet that uh, Warren Buffett was buying all through 2008, 2009, because stocks were on sale as they are now. So, um, if you're, so, so let me talk about a couple of things. If you're fully invested, which is normally what we, we recommend because it's expensive to be out of the market if the markets are doing well. And nobody knows from day to day, month to month, year to year, how the markets are gonna do. So it's very hard. All the studies show that, all the studies and all the results 
show that uh, if you're successfully at timing the market, you were just lucky. Uh, so uh, for most people, you want to be stay for fully, pretty fully in, invested. Well, the other part of that is that in your portfolio, part of it's going to be in, they're going to be in different investments. And the ones that are, that are decreasing in value, that means others are in relationship in terms of percentage of your portfolio, others are, uh, are holding their value and are, are a bigger part of your portfolio. So uh, if you ha had bonds and stocks and the stocks go down, then you would sell some of the bonds and buy more stock as the market goes down. And this is a way to buy low and sell high. That's the idea. It also, if you have a, you know, if you, in our portfolios, these structured portfolios, like I said, we're trying to maintain the same percentages of each investment category. And so if one gets smaller, then more is bought. And what gets smaller in relation to the others, then it, it more is bought. Or if one gets larger, that one is sold and lower one is bought. That's what rebalancing is. Um, it's it's uh, when I used to do, do my own do-it-yourself portfolios. Number one, it's hard to sell your winners, so it makes it hard for people to really want to rebalance when they should, especially in rising markets. Uh, to to sell your you know if you've been holding Apple and you're making a jillion dollars in Apple, and so you that makes your portfolio hold more Apple, that makes the Apple more, increases the risk in your portfolio, but you don't want to sell it because it's done so well, but you should be selling it and putting it into other parts of your portfolio if it's well designed. Uh, and I just use Apple as an example of, a, of the kind of asset that would be hard for somebody to sell out of if it had done, well, Apple's done very well over the years. Um, okay, um, now, we also talk all the time about not trying to pick stocks or time the market or listen to some guru who says this stock or that mutual fund is going to do great in the future because nobody knows. So this next line says buy and fly. We preach continuously that stock picking, market timing are investing mistakes unless you're just lucky. However, there's a narrow exception. If there's a crash and you have cash or bonds, now is the time to be using them to buy equities. And of course, you need two key ideas firmly in mind to proceed with this. You need to have an investing philosophy that uses the best thinking about how to succeed with your life savings. That's so you'll be confident. You want the odds to favor your long-term success. People need confidence in what they're doing to proceed at all as the markets crash. Secondly, you need to plan on when to put the money in as the market slide. Here's the problem. It's never clear when the markets will bottom out until the panic is well over. So what should you do? Divide the amount you have to invest into as many increments as you'd like and put a party in every week or month or whatever period suits you and your own mental thoughts on this. But what you're trying to avoid is the regret of putting the money in too early and then watching the market sink some more. Of course, the risk is that part of your money will not be invested during the market drop. But usually investing in increments creates less regret than going in too early. So uh, if you have cash, or if you're in the position to rebalance uh, from bonds into equities, then uh, you should be thinking about doing that. Uh, and then I have this paragraph, ditching and switching. When markets crash, people start watching their investments like a hawk. Now, this is also very curious. You know, for long periods of time, we don't pay much, you know, if the markets are gently up or slightly down, we don't pay much attention to the values in our, our 401k. When the markets get like this, when they crash, everybody is starting to look at it. Of course, the first advice I would give to people is don't look at your stuff very closely. You know it's down and uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't make your add to your sunny disposition to see watch it go down. You know from the news that the these all these indexes are down like a bullet. Okay. Um, but anyway, it's funny that our attention shifts to as soon as the markets start into one of these crashes, all of a sudden that's one of the big stories is how our, how our investments are doing and how ours are 
doing in particular is a worry to us. At any rate, the news is full of stories about the terrible state of things. At times like this, many people lose confidence in their investments, their advisor, and fear losing more. Well, if you're gonna change horses, how do you decide which one? First, you have to have a sound concept. Second, you need a strategy for the switch. So uh, then it says tactics for changing horses. And uh, it, says, it says, if you're not comfortable with your stuff, turn the worry into a better plan. First, you don't, you don't buy an annuity. You don't talk to people that wanna sell you one. Your salesman, don't talk to your banker, you'll end up with a CD. These investments cannot make enough to help you and your family in retirement. And of course, I offer workshops and meetings and give you a plan for the future that's based on better thinking about this. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm a fiduciary, I'm not a salesman. Uh, it, the difference is a fiduciary is, is uh, uh, where our, my recommendations are supposed to be in your best interest. The, the, you know, the financial guy you talk to at, uh, at uh, Fidelity or at Vanguard or at uh, Merrill Lynch or wherever, Edward Jones, um, for the most part, they are not fiduciaries. Uh, they are, um, they are, uh, the, the standard is that the things they sell you have to be suitable for people kind of like you. So it's not a, a very tight standard. Um, so at any rate, I'm required to make decisions that are in your best interest. And I would, uh, if, if you sit down with me, I'm going to look at where you are and, and, and talk to you about that and try to figure out if there's something we can do at this point. Once you have the plan, you can put the current, your current equity funds or stocks into the new selection of equities at any point in the market decline because the new selection should behave better for you in the long run. Your current equity or stock investments are down and so are the ones you're going to buy. And there doesn't really seem like a practical way to analyze or time this move. Um, on the other hand, your cash and bonds may provide an opportunity to buy into the market decline. In this case, divide the amount of cash that you want to go into the markets and put it in in increments. Um, now, what's the other thing that we all do, and everybody does this, and it's one of the it's the bane of our existence. We analyze things and analyze them, and we, we're paralyzed by that. So um, if you're worried about this, or if it's time, you know, you've been thinking about this because you've got time on your hands, and that's all, you know, there's so much, in, so much talk about on the news and stuff, then uh, uh, give us a call, and we'll be glad to, to share our insights with you and see if there's something um, useful that we could do for you. Any rate, that's kind of the story on that. Now, um, I don't know if, when, when I was thinking about writing this article, I was trying to cover the different bases of, of what you would think about what to do and you know, how to invest into a market panic. And I kind of think I covered most of them, um, but you might disagree. So I want to go back and, uh, uh, stop the, the screen share here and I'm going to go back so I can see you guys. And uh, are there questions or thoughts on this or you got a, another angle on uh, this investing in a crash? It's, a, it's, a, it's an odd and, um, you know, people, this is a time when people are interested in this and thinking about it. And somebody might have some ideas that I haven't thought about. Mary, can you unmute yourself and uh, let me know if, uh, are you seeing anything here that? Uh... No, I wasn't, but I just want to remind everybody, if you do want to speak, you just go to the bottom of your page and where it says mute my audio, you just click that and you can unmute yourself and uh, give us any of your thoughts or feelings. You guys are kind of quiet now. If we were sitting here drinking coffee, you guys would raise your hand and and uh, tell me where I've got something wrong or right here. Probably tell me something I got wrong. <laughs> well, hey, I've, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, this morning, and uh, we look forward to talking to you in spite of the uh, the the uh, lockdown. The law firms are still part of the uh, 
the businesses that are supposed to remain closed right now, the, the investment uh, firm is not required to do that. Uh, it's part of the critical infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, but at any rate, we're, we're on the phone. Um, we're all working uh, uh, on different client work, both in the law firm and on the financial services side. So feel free to call us and, uh, or email us, and we'd be glad to help you during this period. Um, and maybe we have some time on our hand for a change. Uh, did somebody have a chat? Did I see something that blinked? I don't have anything coming up on mine. I just want to say thank you. It was very helpful. Uh, it's my first time joining this session, so I appreciate it. Um, just um, being from afar learning, uh, so I appreciate it. Maybe I have time to join another one and continue to learn. Thank you. Okay, Bob went silent. <laughs> yeah, okay, let me unmute myself if I can. Where am I muted? Now we hear you. Oh, you do? Okay, good. I was going to say, uh, um, uh, um, please uh, feel free to give us a call. Also, I, this it looks like this Zoom. I don't know how well it works on your computers, but uh, we're getting pretty comfortable with it. And so um, we can have these Zoom meetings anytime, one-on-one. -on -one. And so it seems like to me where we can, and you can actually talk and, and see, share computer screens and stuff. This may be a very effective way for us to meet without you having to come into the office. So we might be able to make some good use of this time uh, during the period when people are staying home. So um, maybe an opportunity. Look forward to talking to you guys. Thanks for uh, coming to the, the coffee this morning. Appreciate it.